Namaste, it's Sahara Rose, and welcome back to the Highest Self Podcast, a place where we discuss what makes you your soul's highest involvement. If it's your first time listening, welcome. I am so grateful that our souls are connecting at this part of our journeys, and I know so many people are opening up to greater spiritual wisdom and gnosis, the internal knowing that we all have. And I feel like the spiritual awakening is more of a spiritual remembering. It's remembering what we already knew for so many different lifetimes that are resurfacing right now. And it's really an exciting time because conversations left and right are about healing and empowerment and dharma and yoga sutras and chakra system and so many other beautiful healing modalities that aren't new, but rather ancient. And I'm really excited because we're going to be diving into one of these practices today on this episode. So if you haven't heard yet, my new book, Discover Your Dharma, just came out on January 5th. And I am just beyond so grateful to see it making its way to so many of your homes, just the messages I'm receiving, the reviews that I'm reading on Amazon, the number of people who are saying it finally gave them that ounce of courage, permission, intuition that they were needing to just finally take that step towards their dharma. So if you haven't checked out the book yet, Discover Your Dharma is all about finding your soul's purpose. I created this framework called the Dharma Blueprint Framework that really guides you step by step throughout the process of unraveling your soul's purpose through the dharma archetypes, looking at what you're excited about looking at the obstacles you've overcome, different superpowers that you have, and so much more. So this book is really my life's work so far. I have gone through my own journey of not knowing what my purpose was, my family being really against me living my purpose, and trying to believe in myself even though I had no evidence to until finally I wrote my first book, second book, third book. And this book, Discover Your Dharma, is really all about the how, how I was able to go from confusion to clarity and live a life in true alignment with my soul and all of the tools and tips that I've learned along the way that I essentially channeled down to share with you. So if you haven't checked out the book yet, head over to my show notes. You will find a link, iamsaharrose.com slash dharma. And on that link, not only can you get the book wherever books are sold internationally, as well as on all Audible, Kindle, etc. But you can also submit your receipt and get three exclusive practices that are not included in the book. Now, those are my Discover Your Dharma meditation, my Dharma embodiment practice to dance your Dharma, and my Dharma tapping practice. So head over to IamSaharRose.com slash Dharma to get those bonuses and to get the book. Now, since the book coming out, I shared a little update in my last solo cast that I did about embodiment as the sun being and rewilding. And I have been deepening my understanding of my human design archetype, which is the projector and going deeper into my different gates in my chart and really looking at myself and giving myself a lot more rest than I ever have before. I'm someone who can keep going and keep creating. And the moment I'm done with something, I'm I'm on to the next. And I believe a lot of it is because I just have a huge mission here that I'm very excited to create all of these things and have the energy to bring it alive because I'm in that stage five of the five stages of Dharma that I speak about in the book. But stage five is really when you're living your Dharma. So you have all of this energy However, does that mean you should just work all the time? No. And that is something that because I have been in this process of writing the book the past two years and, you know, creating everything else that I create, it has just been go, go, go for the past decade when I wrote my first book. So I have been really trying to lie down a lot more throughout my day, just, you know, in between things, just lie down to let my body be in a more relaxed receiving state, lying down on my foam roller vertically up my spine. So from my head to the base of my tailbone and opening up my arms to let my body be in this more relaxed state. And I've also been really deep diving into somatics and using different 
body state practices to transform our minds. So it's something that I'm really excited about and diving deeper into and integrating in my own life. And in this episode today, we're going to be talking about different practices specifically from the Kundalini tradition. So Kundalini is a method of yoga. And in this episode, we discuss how it's different than a traditional Hatha yoga class, which is typically the type of yoga you would do at the gym or at a yoga studio, power yoga, vinyasa yoga. These are really in the Hatha school of yoga, but Kundalini is something that is a bit different. It's a more energetic style of yoga. So I wanted to bring on my two friends, Britt and Tara, who are really experts at Kundalini. They are Kundalini yoga teachers, and they just wrote this new book all about different morning practices that we can do with Kundalini. So in this episode, we dive deep into what Kundalini yoga is all about. I asked them about this ancient technology and how using the breath and different yogic postures, we can achieve states of euphoria, bliss, and even samadhi, the feeling of complete peace within. Now, these girls are dear friends of mine, and I love their more feminine approach to kundalini yoga, which can be very rigid and masculine sometimes. I've tried kundalini in the past and never totally resonated with it because of that reason, but I love how they bring a more feminine, open approach so it doesn't have to be as strict. And I know their book has plenty of meditations that you can just do on their own. They are incredible people to learn from. So without further ado, let's welcome Elevate the Globe Girls, Britt and Tara to the Highest Self Podcast. And before we get started, I have an announcement for you. Do you feel deep in your soul that you have a purpose but are overwhelmed and confused about where to start? Are you a multi-passionate person who needs a clear focus and direction so you can truly make progress and impact this year? Do you know deep down that your highest form of joy is your highest form of service but need clarity on how to make that your reality? Well, you're not alone. Our school system and society has not trained us to follow our intuition and honor our dharmas. In fact, it can feel like totally foreign territory. But the thing is, discovering your dharma is the most important work you can do. And without discovering our dharma, we will never experience true happiness because happiness is the byproduct of living your purpose. I was where you might be right now, confused and overwhelmed about my own dharma, questioning if I even had one, if my dreams were just wishful thinking, or if my obstacles had happened to me for a reason because it was my opportunity to share them. And through my journey of deconditioning and unraveling and getting true with myself for many, many years, I finally got the courage to write my first book, second book, third book, my newest book, Discover Your Dharma, and help thousands of others discover their dharmas too. So I'm so excited to bring you the first ever course, the 21 day Dharma discovery journey. In this course, in just 21 days, in less than 10 minutes a day, I will be your Dharma coach, guiding you step-by-step on how to discover your Dharma. So if you're interested in learning more, head over to IamSaharaRose.com slash Dharma Discovery. Again, that's IamSaharaRose.com slash Dharma Discovery. The link is in the show notes, and I'm so excited to see you live in your Dharma. Welcome, ladies, to the Highest Soul Podcast. It's so great to finally have you here. We're so happy to be here. Thank you. Yes. So the first question I'd love to ask you is, what makes you your highest self? So we'll start with you, Britt. I am my highest self when I am wackiest Mm. in my full expression. Mm. Mm, I love it. We were just singing some karaoke. So (laughs) I totally resonate with that one. I love it. And it can, you know, it's like, here you guys are like Kundalini, like teachers and authors. And it's when you're just wacky and being playful and fun that you feel like your highest self. So I love that answer. What about for you, Tara? For me, it I'm a highest self when I am not operating from any space of fear at all. It's just not present whatsoever. I love that when we're just like, yep, this is it. Like there's no shackles of fears like attached to it. Yeah. And there's been a lot of, I think that's when you have to work through constantly. Yeah. 100%. 
Yes. So you guys, you know, we haven't done a conversation on Kundalini yoga before, and it's something that you guys have been teaching and practicing for so many years now. So can you share with us how both of you got into Kundalini yoga and what is Kundalini yoga? Yeah, I feel like Brett... We got into it first, so she'll go. She'll she'll share. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> yeah, so this is Britt, and I like probably many of you, and and you too, Sahara. Found Kundalini when I was at one of my darkest points, and was just in a breakup. Was moving, didn't like my job. Everything was kind of crumbling around me, and I was looking for answers and looking for healing and looking to expand and and really alchemize a lot of the energy from my childhood that I hadn't looked at or healed. And as the universe would have it, I went into a gym yoga class that I thought was just working out my abs for the weekend and nothing more than that. And it ended up being a kundalini class. And in that class, I sat in the back. I had no clue what was going on. I had this full emotional breakdown and experience that I hadn't had in so long. And I just felt so connected to the practice that almost unconsciously, I started going back every single week. And that's really how it started. From there, I just started listening to the mantras and talking to the teacher and asking him all of these different questions. And I had all these experiences and I was so excited. And it just opened up this whole new avenue for me where... I was finally excited about something that wasn't drinking, you know, wasn't destructive, wasn't consumed in all of these patterns and people that had been consuming my energy for so long. So it was it was cool, it was exciting and from there everything just started expanding and went to Costa Rica on a yoga retreat and started um, just pulling in a morning practice at one point and practicing on my own even pretty early on and became a teacher and and yeah that's kind of how it all really kicked off for me but it was an exciting definitely like turning point in my life Mm, I love that. And when we look at the, those five stages of Dharma discovery, you like literally went through each one of just like something needed to change. You ended up at this gym yoga class and then you went, went on your <laughs> spiritual journey and like research it more. And here you are. It was just like a perfect example of it in action. So thank you for sharing that. What was it like for you, Tara? Well, it's funny because the, it, the Brit and I, well, we've known each other since we were 12. So our paths have always like merged at some point and then, you know, separated and merged. And it was at a merging point and it was at Brit's bachelorette party that, you know, up until this point, let's backtrack, up until this point, I was, I had gone through a breakup. I had moved across the country multiple times. I was just at a place where I knew that I needed to make a change, right? Like I knew if I kept going, things were not going to be turning out in my favor, meaning I was not going to be living in my highest self. It would just be bad. So I knew I had to make a change. And so I went through a breakup and I was finding myself alone a lot. And I was turning to astrology and I was kind of dating a lot of people. And I still felt like, what is going on here? Like I was turning to psychics to tell me things and also to learn from them so that I understood how to use my own gifts. But then we come to Brit's bachelorette party and she's telling me, and I've watched Brit go through her whole journey. And I knew that if Brit's gone through, she's, she, I'm watching her going, she's really good right now. I knew she went through some dark stuff and now she's really good. And she wants to teach us a class at our bachelorette party, I had to leave early. I didn't get to do it with her, but it was enough because some of the girls were like kind of being mean about it. They were like, this is weird. Why are you doing that? Just like (laughs) making fun of her. And I'm like, don't make fun of Brett. Come on. Like she just, you know, like this is helping her. And so it just intrigued me. It was like, what is this? And I, it took me a year to find a studio to even take it up in San Francisco. I was living there at the time. There really wasn't any. Um, there was a, an ashram in the hate in the hate on um, hate Ashbury. And it was like five people a class on by donation. And so I had to take an Uber every time and it was across the city. And I was like, this is a lot. <laughs> and I just I took it one day though, because I was like, Brit is working through all this stuff. She's doing cool stuff. And I took a class and I think I did spinal twists where you're, you're like using a lot of your breath. 
And I just had this feeling of getting a little high in my body. And I'd never really done drugs at all up until that point. And I was trying to lay off on the alcohol. And so I was feeling this thing that I'm like, is this what it feels like to be high on something? (laughs) I was like, I can do this with my own breath. The teacher was like, if you're feeling that, you're just creating energy. And I lost my mind. I was like, this is unreal. And I was just obsessed. And then went on a long journey with it, went really deep, dark into a lot of clearing, a lot of a lot of crying on the floor for no reason, but for a reason, you know, I didn't know what was going on. A lot of shifting stuff in my body. And it just kind of landed me, you know on the pathway to where we are now. So it was really through this like this kind of convergence of seeing Britt at her bachelorette party, seeing the change she had gone through and going, what did she do? Mm, I love that because, you know, when we're living our dharma or even just on the pathway for it, we inspire others to do the same. So it's not her being like, yo bitches, get your lives in order. Like it was (laughs) like, she's just like, I love doing this practice. I'm in fact so inspired that I want to spend my bachelorette party doing it, that you're like, there must be something to this. And just seeing her shift and her her glow inspired your own too. Exactly. Yeah. So for those people who might not know, what is kundalini yoga? Because I feel like it's a word a lot of people have like heard, but they're just not quite sure what it is. Definitely. Yeah. So you'll, if you Google Kundalini, you'll see all these crazy stories about the Kundalini energy. And of course, we all have the Kundalini energy at the base of our spine, coiled like the snake. And that's what spirals up through our chakras. And that's the energy that we can activate. And the form of Kundalini yoga and the practice of it is an ancient technology. It was recorded in a lot of yogic scriptures and traditions as one of the first yogas. So a lot of the Hatha and uh, the Bhakti and all the beautiful yogas you can find elements and pieces of them in kundalini and kundalini tends to have pieces of all of them in a traditional class so you'll find the mantra the breath work the movement and the and the stretching and that yoga and then the chanting and more of the the solitude and the silence in shavasana so it's a lot of the different elements but it is the yoga of awareness And it really does uh, help so fast to really clear the subconscious mind and just up-level your consciousness to really be aware of who you are and why you're here and really what you're doing. So it's cleansing out the garbage. It works pretty fast because it's more intense, but... But yeah, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful practice. And and there's so many different ways to experience it because Mm -hmm. there are thousands of meditations and thousands of Kriyas. So you can really pick and choose what you want to focus on. Mm. So for someone who's like, well, I... I've done a lot of different yoga classes like downward dog and child's pose and you know, vinyasa flow. What's the difference between that style of yoga and kundalini yoga? Yeah, I love that question because I think we we hear it a lot and it's I see it as more of a connecting with your spirit, connecting with your higher self, connecting uh, with the cosmos, connecting in, but connecting within, right? So it's very, very big on connection and it's it's very it's devotional to the self and to the creative force and wisdom inside of you and activating that. And the experience I've personally had with Kundalini Yoga is that almost of like, you can go to places of transcendence, which I have not found in other yogas, which I love other yogas for different things. But the practice of Kundalini is one that feels almost like you get on a rocket ship and you go literally to the stars every day and you go higher and higher and higher because you're actually like utilizing that Kundalini force that that does propel you in in ascension, really. And it helps you ascend your own uh, limited beliefs and all the limitations and the fears and whatnot. You're activating so much energy and you're breaking through so much with the angles and the triangles of the, the, the specific structures that are called for with the times. It's very, it can be very masculine, but it's also very feminine in a way because it's very, it can be very gentle as well. 
So it's, it's just an experience, right? It's a spiritual experience all baked in sometimes even three minutes. You're like, whoa, where did I just go in three <laughs> minutes? Mm. Yeah. So what are like some examples of Kundalini yoga practices? Mm. So many. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> there are so many. So as teachers, often teachers will have books in front of them because uh, like you were saying on our podcast, it's almost impossible to, you were saying about remembering the sequences was hard for you. And it's almost impossible to learn all these things. Of course, we know so many meditations and Kriyas by now, but there are thousands. So you kind of gravitate to ones that you're working on and ones that you want to help you or focus on. So that's really how our book and all of our rituals came about. Because for example, there's a meditation for addiction. And so we have like the addiction rehab in the book because there's this meditation that you can do for three or 11 minutes where your thumbs are out and you're pressing on your temples beside your, your eyes and you're, you're pulling the jaw back and there's mantras and everything. And it's a technology that science is now getting behind and able to have results and kind of prove, which is exciting, but it's this weird, wacky combination that actually activates a specific result. So there's something for everything really, but a lot of times it comes down to something that you're looking to heal and release or activate more of within yourself. So, so many different ones. There's one for prosperity that's really big and well-known that isn't just for money or wealth, but it just activates your energy like a flower to bloom, expansion. And there's... there's, there's, there's what about so this ego eradicator? It's like every mm, time I hear yes. Kundalini Yoga, I hear of this one. Okay. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. This one is <laughs> Breath of Fire is the base of it, right? It's that equal inhale, exhale. It's um, really energizing breath. Right, so it's actually energizing the lower chakras as well as the, is the well the solar plexus right is part of the lower chakras, but it's really pumping energy, and what you're doing is you have your thumbs out in a V over your head, elbows are straight, and you're activating meridian lines, and and it's activating uh, your heart center, and you're pumping energy from your lower chakras into your heart center, and you're also like tuning up your aura, and it just helps you to balance the ego, if you will, you know? So balance the ego with the spirit. And it's very, very good warm up. It's very, it's a perfect three minute meditation. You can do it for as long as you want, but you can do three minutes of breath work sitting in the car or before you go in a meeting and it helps reset you. It helps come back into your heart center, come back into your body and, and really speak and, you know, nurture the room with love versus coming from a place of ego. Mm. up in your head. Yeah. My friend used to teach Kundalini yoga and I would go to some of her classes, but like she wanted us to hold our arms out for like 11 minutes. I was like, <laughs> I cannot do this, but it kind of felt like almost like militaristic. Like, is that mm. part of the background of Kundalini yoga? It felt like warrior training. It mm. can be. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people call it like the Hogwarts like, <laughs> and especially when I started in like West Hollywood with Tej and Gramuk and some of the older teachers that really are in their 70s and 80s now still teaching that we're really connected to the tradition and kind of the roots of it really created that kind of energy. So, so yeah, it does have that side of it. Like Tara said, like it definitely has that masculine structure side of it. And then it does have the feminine. I would say 100% we're both known for pulling in more of the feminine energy. And we've been told that so many times that in our classes, we don't have that kind of militant energy. It's more loving and more feminine, but it's the same practices. So it's just a little softer. And I think it's just really whatever you need in the moment. For me, when I first started, I did it helped me to have more of that militant energy. And that teacher that I mentioned was very much like that. Like he would do all the most rigorous Kriyas and the craziest 11 minute hands are out and do not bring them down <laughs> type of teaching style. But it really like kicked my energy and gear and helped me to shift a lot. So I think it definitely depends on the teacher. 
definitely depends on what practices you gravitate toward and what you need and desire in the moment. But there are definitely a balance of both. Mm -hmm. Another one that my friend would do is like hold your arms out like towards each other's yeah. shoulders. And I think like staring to each other's left eye. Is this, oh, a, oh. You know, is this one of the poses? Facing um, like, each other? Facing each other like this. And you have to like hold your arms out for like 30 minutes or something. And oh, what I is wonder... this white tantra component? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's called white tantric. And there are some, we've done some where <laughs> I remember my first white tantric, my arms had to be diagonal and they had to be holding the other person. And I was staring into his eyes for 30 minutes and his whole face transformed. And it was just, it was crazy. Sometimes you hold up for, for 60, 62 minutes. And we do every Thursday with our, or not every Thursday, but you know, the mastermind that we, we host, they, they do it a 62 minute meditation every single Thursday. And it becomes normal. And what what the what you're doing, what's happening when you're holding your arms out for 11 minutes, you're like, this is freaking torture, right? Like, oh my God. You start to see patterning of how you react to situations, right? And then you keep your arms out and you hold it and your subconscious starts to pick up on, it starts to relax. It starts to pick up and go, I actually can get through this. I, I'm starting to feel a little bit better. My arms might be going numb. Oh, I can get through this. I can hold this for 11 minutes. I can do hard stuff. I can do, we can do 60 minutes. I can do anything. I basically can do anything. You start to be able to break through because you're watching your brain tell the stories it always tells you mm -hmm. that stops you from doing things. And so it's a way, in a way, stillness in some of these kind of practices because there's so many in Kundalini Yoga. But these are the kind where you start to really see like, oh, those are the, what kind of stories are actually coming up in my mind? And wow, do I do that in other ways? You know, mm -hmm. one of the biggest stories I would find was about 10 seconds before Every time the teacher would be like, okay, bring your hands down, I would bring my hands down. And I'd be like, are you always giving up like right before you get the thing? Mm. Because it seems like this is a pattern. And I started seeing it in everywhere in my life. And I was able to, to break through it by just doing weird things on my mat <laughs> for I long love periods it. of time, you know? Yeah, the way we move our body it gives us so much information and energy. And like, are we someone that's really hard on ourselves? Are we someone that gives up? Are we someone that says, I'm too weak? Are we someone that pushes our boundaries and doesn't listen? So it's like, gives us just such information that I feel like no words ever could is just mm -hmm. to be in the practice and the embodiment of it. Yep, exactly. So true. Yeah. So is white tantric a kind of kundalini or is this like a different thing? Yeah, so white tantric is a type of kundalini and it's normally one whole day. Like they have them in LA or they had him, they had them before twice a year and it's an eight to 10 hour day. And then there'll be winter solstice and summer solstice. We've been up a few times up in New Mexico where it's three or four days of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you always have a partner and it's very specific and there's specific people that are the teachers of it. And it really is powerful, but yeah. it's very intense. And um, it can really break through a lot. Like, you know, they mm -hmm. say like 10 years of meditation or something like that. It's very potent mm -hmm. energy work, but I've had some very expansive experiences as well in them. Like a pretty crazy story was my first time that I did it. And you can choose a partner. Or you can just get paired up with somebody. And I felt like I should just get paired up with somebody. And I didn't know why. And I sat across from this girl and we went into this meditation and I was getting very annoyed the whole time. Like so annoyed because she kept putting her hands down. She kept, you know, she wasn't like looking at me in the eyes and she was having all these problems. And I started getting so frustrated. Like, why did I get this partner? This is the worst partner. I'm not going to get anything out of it. And the day goes on, the day goes on. She starts to tell me things. We start to get to know each other. And her mom had actually passed away. And she had just left the country, left her job, and just went and traveled and just completely didn't deal with it at all. And it was coming into her awareness to actually heal and look at, and she could barely handle it. And so had this whole experience with her. Fast forward, you know, two years later, my mom got diagnosed with cancer. 
And I was going through a whole journey with my mom and then she passed away. And then a year after that, I got this vision and a meditation showing me that three years before that, I had been involved with a lot of healing around my mother's death before it even happened with this woman Mm -hmm. to prepare me and to assist me and help my energy with being able to deal with it then. So it's those kinds of things with hindsight that I had no idea what was happening or why I was there or what I was going through. But then looking back, I understood exactly what that journey was. So it definitely has a lot of layers in the white tantric. Mm -hmm. And it can be really profound. Yeah. We'll take a quick break so I can give a shout out to our sponsors. You know, when you open up a box and are in love That is what happened when I opened up the kits from Anima Mundi Herbals. Their Sacred Heart Love Kit has my favorites, including Blue Lotus Tea, which enhances intuition, Makuna, which enhances dopamine, Cacao, which opens the heart, Ethically Sourced Palo Santo Mist, and their Euphoria Elixir. It is divinity in a box and pairs perfectly with their coconut milk powder. I mean, Anima Mundi is literally my love language and And I know you are going to be obsessed with her stuff, which you can learn more about on episode 240 with the founder. She's gifted us a generous 20% off, which you can get at animamundiherbals.com with coupon code Sahara. That's animamundiherbals.com, A-N-I-M-A-M-U-N-D-I herbals.com with coupon code Sahara. Are you that person that all your friends and family members come to when they need wellness advice? Are you constantly looking up new ways to heal and balance your mind, body, and spirit, including listening to this podcast? Well, have you ever considered having a career becoming a holistic health coach where you get to decide your own hours, work with people, tackling the subjects that you are the most passionate about, and having financial freedom along the way? Well, I am so excited to be teaming up with my very own Alma Mater Institute for Integration Integrative Nutrition to offer their biggest discount yet. You'll receive $2,250 off tuition, an extra bonus that they're offering just with my High Self podcast listeners on how to launch your dream book. This course is going to get you super clear on what your book is about and how to bring it out into the world. I've created a webinar for you on how to have a thriving business as a health coach. So using social media, creating passive income, how to have a wait list of clients and become the best known coach in your niche with raving testimonials. Tickets to a live upcoming IIN conference where I will be meeting you over there. Super excited to connect. And a bundle of all digital wellness guides like Ayurveda, self-love, whole food eating, etc. So all you have to do is head over to my show notes. You'll see the link over there. It's a little bit.ly link. It'll take you right there. You'll be able to receive a sample class, check out the curriculum, get all your questions answered. And I'm so excited to have you on this mission, raising the vibration of the planet together as a health coach. Again, head over to my show notes. You'll see the link right there and I'll see you inside. I feel like just eye gazing is such a profound practice. Like Mm -hmm. it's so hard to see and be seen and to like hold that gaze. And like every part of us just wants to like hide or look away or laugh or like say something to like negate the experience. And then like, sometimes I catch myself when I'm eye gazing, like I almost check out by trying to analyze them. Do you know oh, what I mean? Yeah. Of like, yes. oh, like, let me look at her eye shape or her this or that, like rather than just like being there and connecting and like, you can just pick up on like, where the things do mm-hmm. I go? Do I, in experience, try to analyze it for more like distance from it? Do I try to like, or sometimes if I'm eye gazing and I can see that person is feeling very emotional and wants to start crying, I'll like try to smile and like make them happy. And it's like, there's yeah. my, you know, entertainer, like, you know, maybe that person just needs to cry and I should just like, watch her, you know, and like hold that stoic energy. So it really teaches us so much about ourselves. It does. And that, you know, what the way that energy works, it's interesting because in the white tantric, there's sometimes room, the room is what, how many people would you say? Like 800 people? Yeah. It's huge. Thousands. Thousands and thousands. We've done it with, I've done it with thousands of people at summer solstice. Yeah. And they like line you up and you're, 
you're just pairs and pairs of people and you have to line up pretty exact. So what's happening is the it's using this like diagonal energy that's being pushed through the room, through the Mahan Tantric, the person that's organizing and, and hosting it and, and teaching it and leading it. And energy is being pushed and you can kind of feel it. You can kind of feel this like sort of swaying and that energy is like that, that sort of six dimensional, this is my interpretation of it, that six dimensional energy that, that that is geometric shapes that kind of come in and smash through things. And then you're also physically holding, you know, postures that are like awkward and weird and you're mirroring back things to the other person. And you're also seeing, you know, getting a mirror of, of yourself from them. And it's just wild, the sort of depth that you can go because you're sitting there for so long and you're almost in this trance and the energy is like moving like this rocking ship, just like, like breaking. What's that? What's that? Um, pong, not Pong. Is that what that thing oh, was called? Ping Pong? No, the, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the old uh, computer game that was like, the like Ping Pong, you know, and you had- the snake. Snake, right? No? I, I don't- Yeah. yeah okay. Probably. I don't okay. remember. I know These what are, you're talking I'm, about. Yeah. I'm bad with analogies. <laughs> <laughs> But, but yeah, it is a good practice to look at your partner in the eye too. Mm-hmm. Like you were saying, yes. just even for a minute, you can mm-hmm. start to really see people's soul. Even like friends, like sometimes I've like eye gazed with like a friend I've known for years, but we've never eye gazed before and you do it. And it's just like such a deeper connection between the two of you. And like sometimes with friendships, you take the other person for granted or you see them in your own light and just to eye gaze and be like, oh my goddess, like you are my sister. Like I am so grateful for you. It's something that we just don't do enough of insight. I've actually heard it can even work well online. Like eye gazing oh. online has been proven to be quite effective, maybe not as much as in person, but so important we continue that connection. And what do you recommend for people who they may try doing kundalini yoga, but they're like doing the poses and like they're weird, right? And they start judging <laughs> themselves and they're like, this is so weird. Like, what am I doing right now? Like, this is crazy. Or like, is this cultish? Like, is something wrong with me if I'm doing this? How can we <laughs> overcome that inner dialogue? <laughs> for sure. I felt like I felt like that for a while in the beginning. And yeah, I think it's just about realizing that for me, I was doing so many weird things in my life that were not actually serving me and helping me. So if I could just let go and not worry about what other people thought of me and actually experience weird things that were helping me, then why not? So I think it's just about trying it and being open and seeing what you feel and what results you get. And then for the most part, most people that we see and ourselves, you just don't care anymore after that. You're like, Mm -hmm. oh, this is worth it. You know, it doesn't really matter. Why do like the weirdest things in the airport? And it's just like, <laughs> I'm like, I, I hope now people ask me what I'm doing. What are like good like airport or like on the go kundalini practices? Oh, so do? many things you can do. Cat cow. We do cat cow and kundalini faster, right? So okay. you're really utilizing the... It's always like stuff you want to utilize the breath. Mm-hmm. Like extra. Like be extra with your breath. Like... And it's usually through the nose, unless it's specified through the mouth. And it's like, you just want to hear, you want to hear yourself. Like your breath is singing to you, right? Breath of fire. And anyway, with your hands in Gyan Mudra, your index finger, thumb touching, you could do the ego eradicator. God, you could do that on the plane even. People probably think you're crazy and that's fine, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) You know, um, there's just, you know, even shoulder shrugs. (laughs) squeezing your shoulders up to your ears and dropping them down and using the breath. It really helps to open up the throat chakra and just relax. And then there's some like stress breath works that you can do. Like the there's like segmented breaths. You can do four in, four out through the nose, eight in, eight out through the nose. You can do, uh, there's one for, we love the one for releasing anger, fists of anger. And it's through your mouth. <sighs> And you sway your hands are in fists with thumb, actually with it underneath all your four fingers. And you're like swimming almost like backstroke. <laughs> and it's like getting angry. And there's a whole meditation for that. But, you know, if you're in the airport, I, my go-to is like just breath of fire, straight breath of fire. And that's that equal inhale, exhale through the nose, pumping mm. the navel. 
And I want to ask yeah. you guys about this because I have, so like traditionally breath work, like Wim Hof and stuff, it's through the mouth. Yeah. Then I was doing mm-hmm. some reading that said that the breath should always be through the nose because our nose has these like ability to like clear like pollutants and stuff in the air that our mouths do not. And if we're breathing from our mouths, it like creates a fight or flight, like stress response, because the only time we breathe from our mouths is if we're like panting or running away from something. But I know so many breathwork practices are through the mouth and I'm assuming designed that way. So what is your take on nasal versus mouth breathing? Yeah, it does do different things like you're talking about, but typically when it's through the nose, it is more calming. Um, You can do like nostril breathing, of course, where the left side is more calming and the right side is more activating, but it just depends. I mean, I could see what you're saying as far as using the mouth to just kind of be more shallow fight or flight, because if you just test how you breathe normally, typically like if you time yourself for a minute, and you just see how many breaths you take and you become aware like any normal meditation as far as like, are you breathing in your belly? Are you breathing in your chest? You'll probably start to notice that if you're breathing through the mouth, it's more shallow and in the chest and probably faster breaths, more breaths per minute, which is technically and typically a sign of more anxiety Mm -hmm. and where you're more in your head and less in your heart. But yeah, they do different things, like especially breathing in through the nose and out the mouth or in through the mouth and out the nose with different postures and different movements can activate different parts of the brain. But yeah, the typical just nose in and out is more calming and more relaxing and tends to slow down your breath and and open the diaphragm and pull down the lungs and get your breath into the belly more. Mm -hmm. So like it does activate that parasympathetic nervous system that's relaxing, right? And like like what Britt's saying, it's like if you experience it, like experience it. Kundalini Yoga is all about experience. So like try it for yourself. If you're breathing in versus with your mouth, that's way more activating. It's like, whoa, I'm going to pull in so much breath. If you're breathing through your nose and expanding your belly out, that that's expanding and that's relaxing, but it's relaxing into the expansion. And so it's activating different things in your body and it's just a different experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've been like focusing a lot on breathing into my womb space. Yeah. Like bringing it so deeply like down into my womb and like imagining like my yoni is breathing to like bring that like connection there. I know like kundalini shakti is an energy. Does kundalini yoga speak into shakti energy, have practices to enhance our shakti energy? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's like, um, and there's there's even, you know, meditations for it, right? So there's there's major meditations for that that shakti. I mean, there's there's mantras for it, the Adi Shakti, the fem, divine feminine. There's so many ways. That- Adi Shakti. And you know, like lots of like hip rolls and, yes. you know, there's lots of feminine kriyas. There's, you know, kriyas, she meanings, sets of movements to activate, you know, that sexual center, that second chakra, where there's a lot of emotion, where a lot of women, especially we hold a lot of fear and anxiety and trauma as well. And, you know, even from our ancestors. So, you know, this, there's, there's so, that's the thing. It's almost like an adaptogen. You can literally, you can even do one breath work, one, your whole life and get so much from it, even though like you might be able to activate your full like Shakti energy by doing something that actually activates more masculine energy in you because you're deepening. You're deepening your experience and it's an experience. So yes, short answer is yes. There's so many things you can do for your Shakti and we actually have a ritual in our book to, to activate that. And, you know, that's kind of like the the juicy, we should probably do some like, a whole yoni, like, yoni, yeah. There's, yeah. there's like yoni kriyas and you yeah. know, meditations, and yeah, it's interesting. I love yeah. that you're doing that. 
Yeah. And I think it's like, so, so many of us, we can naturally feel like our bodies do want to move in that way. Like our bodies want to circle, they want to undulate, they want to spiral. And that's the texture of the feminine and to allow your body to guide you. I feel like that's when I like really feel the most tapped in. I'm just like putting on music and like letting my body move and however it wants to move. And sometimes it's like beautiful. And sometimes it's just really weird. And it's like, (laughs) whatever my body wants to express, letting myself do that. And I love how with Kundalini yoga for someone that's like, I don't know how to just like play music and dance. Like that feels like really far away from me. They could do these Kundalini practices to give them more structure and like a feeling of like, okay, I'm doing this practice for this long and that can make them feel like safe to step into that. And then I know in Kundalini classes, actually, they often have dance parties at the end. So it's like to celebrate (laughs) with that energy. And Mm -hmm. it's like how beautiful to be able to, and Osho dynamic meditation does the exact same thing. You go through this like, more rigorous process, but then you like bring this essence of like joy and dance that I feel like in Mm -hmm. our society, we forget to celebrate. We forget to like make the light at the end of the tunnel. We're just like, okay, onto the next thing, got over it. Like what's next? And yeah, like, oh my God, it's like my body went through that experience. And now I get to like, I think we've like, in some ways as a society, we're like, we've mastered or not mastered, but we're okay with like rest with like lying down. Like we can all agree, like we need to take more naps. We need to lie down, but we're still not okay with being wild and free and dancing and expressing. I think that's still like the next space that we're going to be moving into. Agree. Yeah. And it's funny what you said about celebration because recently with, with our book coming out, we had a team member that works with us and she was like, did you guys know when you finished writing the book, I said, congratulations to you. And you said, for what? And it was like two days later (laughs) yeah, (laughs) because we would just move on so quickly. So that has been a big part of my Mm -hmm. practice is slowing down and celebrating and bringing in that dance. And even in every posture or movement, how can you celebrate more. So we really grounded in and did a Salyulita trip. And we just Mm -hmm. really consciously and intentionally create grounded space now for that celebration as we're activating and embodying it more and more. But but definitely find that in the practice. There's a lot of like shaking out your body like animals do to release stress or the dance. Mm-hmm. And even laughing out loud is in some Kriyas. And <laughs> there's very wacky things that, like you said, may feel really uncomfortable mm-hmm. and are not just laying down. But if you allow yourself to get to those places and do these things that are really uncomfortable, then you train yourself to do them more often and and to break free from those confines that tell yeah. you, oh, you can't twerk in an airport or whatever it is that is holding you back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it just shows us like these universal truths, how real they are and how universal they are, because whether it's Kundalini yoga or shamanism or, you know, indigenous practices, Middle Eastern practices, African practices, they all have these same types of elements. They all have shaking. They all have trance Mm -hmm. dance. They all have breath work. Like these are things that humans just knew that we needed subconsciously. And we have only just like recently forgotten or, you know, felt too uncomfortable or that it wouldn't fit into like the patriarchal mix for us to express ourselves in this way that now yeah. we're we're refining all of these tools that are age old that have told us like yes your body needs to shake and it needs to stretch it needs to move and it needs to vocalize and all of these different things of like i feel like we've forgotten to be human like sometimes when i'm doing like different practices i'm like oh my god i haven't been a human in so long to just like you know like <laughs> like an animal is just like like allowing themselves to be that animal. Like when do we just let ourselves be like human and make noises and like weird movements? And I feel like <laughs> like Kundalini, shamanism, all of these different practices are like here to remind us that this has always been a part of us. Yes, be weird. It's a, we always feel the the people that are new to Kundalini are always there. It's always a self conscious thing for the most part. It's always like I'm gonna stick my tongue out and breathe. Like and like people will be quiet and we're like. Be louder. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. No one's watching you anyway. Be louder. <laughs> well, we're so domesticated, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like we're like these like domesticated wild animals that are like 
oh, I can't do that. Or like, I'll get in trouble if I do that. Or, you know, and it's just like a lion that has been like made to believe it's a little house cat. And then it's like, oh wait, I can roar and like climb trees and like be in the jungle. And I just think, you know, I was reading this book and this guy had these little like fish and they were in his, his aquarium and he was going to change the water and he put it into the bathtub. Now this is a big bathtub and he was just thinking all these fish are probably going to swim around and they have so much more space now. And they all just stayed exactly where they were, like all around each other. Like they would not move. And it was just such a great example of how as humans, like we confine ourselves, we Mm -hmm. put ourselves in that limitation because we're self-conscious or feel like we can't or feel like we need permission. When not only are we in a massive bathtub, we are in an ocean, but we have confined ourselves to think that we're still in this little fish tank. And I also think the fish tank analogy, what just came through is we think everyone's watching. Like we think right? every person in class is like, Ugh, her tongue, gross. Like no <laughs> one's thinking about you. And that's no. so freeing because everyone's in their own experience. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's fascinating. That's such, such a good analogy, the, the fish. Yeah, because it really does make us realize like, okay, well, how am I, you know, operating in that way in my life? And where is there a bathtub around me that I'm still in a little square here. <laughs> totally. Well, this is why we need more jungle dance parties. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Firmly standing oh. for doing With lion yeah. kundalini breath. And yes. <laughs> All the things, all the celebrations. I love it. Yeah. The dancing has been, well, it's funny as Brit and I, we, we grew up dancing, like actual like trained dancers. And and it's definitely part of how I used to express myself and how I used to move emotion. One of our retreats in Bali, I remember it was the first time I had done like an ecstatic dance in a while. And I remember having to go to my room afterwards and just cry. And I was like, why am I so emotional? I was just dancing. And then I was like, oh, because I just moved so much energy. And it was so fun, but it was like such a release. And so all these things really are. And, you know, I love the Kundalini because it isn't just sitting there and being quiet and trying to to make your monkey mind relax, especially if you're new to meditation. You've got things to do. You've got breath to focus on. There's mantra to listen to. It moves you through and it uses movement. And then now as like we are, I'm more advanced in the practice at this point, I want more dancing and I want kind of all of it. I want all the experience of all of it to really ascend, you know, like to really help myself expand beyond. Mm -hmm. beyond. Yeah. And one of the things I often think about is like, at the time that these practices were originally like downloaded, we were very active as people. Mm -hmm. Like we were farmers, we worked outside, like we did not sit in a chair all day. There were no chairs even back then. So a lot of times we really needed a break to just like sit down and be. Whereas I think in our society, we're like sitting all day already that like what we really need is to like move and like shake and and sweat and twist because we don't get to do those Mm -hmm. things in our normal day that I think like that typical meditation practice of just like sit down and don't move and like close off all your thoughts. It just, I just don't think it works for most people. It doesn't work Mm -hmm. for me for sure because it's just then you have this battle against yourself and then this judgment and then this, I didn't do it right. And, you know, of course there's, beauty and benefits to stillness. And I think stillness is not the goal, but it's the natural place that we arise when we're in total unity. However, when you just try to immediately get there, it doesn't really work. Like I remember Mm -hmm. I was recently reading this conversation between Osho and Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and Mm. they were like debating. And this was like way back. It was Osho's first English talk actually. And Osho was saying, I don't agree with a technique for meditation because this is Osho's understanding because if, if technique is needed, meditation is not there because meditation oh. stillness just naturally arises from a state of being. And then what Maharishi's, you know, disciples were, were saying was, well, the Western mind can't just be in the stillness and nothingness. Like we need a technique because it's our way of getting there. And it was just this beautiful like conversation back and forth. And I totally understood both perspectives. Like in like when I'm in Costa Rica, like I can just sit by the waterfall and I don't need a technique. I am just pure presence and pure being, but Mm -hmm. my life is not sitting by a waterfall every day. So (laughs) sometimes I need to just like 
turn off my laptop and like do this breathwork practice so I can get there. Yes, exactly. Right. And that's exactly what it's, it's not, you know, I, I feel like you can be as devotional to things as you, you need to, but also know, like, you know, in my practice as well, I know when there are times when I am at a place where I could just be quiet and I don't need to move, or I just need to listen to mantra and I don't need to move because I'm already there. And it's the there-ness that you want to get to. That's exactly what it is. It's just getting there, however that works for you. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of the Kundalini has the Kriyas and the movements and the warm ups in the beginning is the idea to then arrive at the meditation at the end to just help with what you're talking about. Because mm-hmm. especially with, it's funny to kind of read some of the old lectures of some of the old yogis and they were talking about that, that people in the West really need this and they need something that can help them to arrive at that place, especially in California and New York, even back in the 60s. So it was just designed to help to get to that point. But exactly like you said, depending on how many stressors you have in your life or how many kids or your schedule and this and that, it might take you longer to be able to get to a place where you're able to just connect deeply to your heart center or to source and receive a message or get clarity on your pathway forward or whatever your intention is. So Mm -hmm. that can definitely help to have that movement and some sort of structure and technique to help you. And like Tara said, to have, you know, devotion or commitment to something that you desire, I've found has helped me have more freedom because for a while I was commitment phobic and I was like, nope, not doing a ritual for 40 days, like not following somebody else's anything. (laughs) And I, you know, started to get into that space. And even if it's just for a little while or you commit to something for five days or 40 or whatever, I found that I was able to open up more freedom and more intuition with having that balance of, you know, the structure and the flow and the masculine and the feminine. So that was a big awakening for me. Like, how can I bring some technique and some flow and like marry these things Mm -hmm. to create something that that allows me to move forward and, and shift and heal and change? Mm, yeah, absolutely. I think if you're definitely someone who struggles with that commitment and that like, right. <laughs> oh my God, like I so resonate with that so often of being like, well, I don't want to do someone else's thing. Like I'm just going to do my <laughs> own. And it's like, you know, maybe it's a thing for a reason, right? Like if all these people yeah. are benefiting from it, there is a reason for it. So sometimes it's like our own ego by being like, I want to do it my way. But then we're like amazed by what happens when we follow through with a process that's set up for our success at the end. Right. Yeah. And then just allowing it to evolve, right? Allowing your your practice with it to evolve and just in general, allowing things to evolve and not being so stuck that like you are moving into a new direction, but you're holding on to something that isn't working for you anymore. You know, yeah. it's like if the meditation, you've gotten what you needed to get because there you can get one, you can do one for your whole life, but you know, your soul knows like when it's time to move on from that one and move and move to a different one. Mm-hmm move to something, you know, a little bit more like movement oriented within a Kriya and maybe need to do a Kriya for 40 days. You know, it's just different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. So many modalities for us. It's like a Disney world of experiences we get to have. <laughs> I love it. That's what I miss most about like festivals. Have you guys gone to Bali Spirit Fest? No, but no. We it's like to. every to. spiritual modality there. So you can like oh hop into like a kirtan and then like a dance practice and then awesome. like a channeling session with a galactic being and then like this. <laughs> and it's like so amazing. I'm like, so this is fun. heaven. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I've I love that. literally been looking at it for like five or six years. Yeah. Yeah. As if it's, I mean, apparently it's happening in 2022. So (gasps) I am there if it's happening. (laughs) (laughs) Done. Yay. Well, where can listeners learn more about these Kundalini practices? I know you have your new book that's out that really breaks it down with like easy to follow morning rituals they can do every day. So can you share with us about it and where people can get it? Definitely. Yeah. So it's called Good Morning Intentions and we have 21 rituals 
that pull in the kundalini yoga. So often there is a breath work or a mantra or a meditation. And then we bring in the other modalities that we love and have helped us as well, like crystals and oils and nutrition and self-care. So there's different focuses for each ritual, like addiction rehab, comparison detox. Uh, There's one for your hormones, for masculine support, more feminine, like postpartum and, and menstruation and all of that. So we basically compiled all of these different modalities that we love and really focused in on specific subjects that you may be drawn to. So we share a lot about our stories and really each of the rituals holds a story about our lives and our healing and how we navigated and used the practices. So it's been so fun to share it. And it's just about learning more about how you might want to create a morning ritual for yourself and how we have and the different elements of a morning ritual. So So it's something for everyone and you can choose a ritual and commit to it for 40 days. You can use the the book like a tarot deck and just pick one. You can jump around. It's really just meant to be fluid and serve you in whatever way you need to. So that is Good Morning Intentions. And and yeah, you can find it all over and Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the places. And we're on Instagram at Elevate the Globe and we share everything over there. So it's easy to find us. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you ladies so much for sharing your light and for making Kundalini Yoga more accessible for so many people. I know it's going to benefit so many people who are moving through so much right now. And share with us, if you're listening to this episode, if you are going to go try Kundalini right now, share us in your <laughs> poses, share your top three takeaways. Maybe we can do a giveaway of the book or something. Yes, so absolutely. Share, share your takeaways, tag us, and we can't wait to see. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having we us. We love on. you. <laughs> Mm, How amazing was that conversation? It really actually inspired me to give Kundalini a chance again, especially with two feminine teachers. I think that that really is going to change the game for myself and for so many of us who don't really resonate with a more rigid masculine type of practice, but rather want to have something that's fluid in our lives. So I definitely recommend checking out their book, checking out their work. They are two beautiful souls and I'm so grateful to have them here. And if you're wanting to dive deeper in discovering your dharma, I invite you to join me for my 21-day dharma discovery journey. You can find all of that information in my show notes and over on my website, IamSaharRose.com slash dharma discovery. If you loved this episode, I would love to send you a free gift, which is the first half of my unreleased book, Eat Right for Your Mind Body Type. This is a different book than Eat Feel Fresh, my first book ever, which is not released anywhere, and I am gifting it exclusively to those who leave a review of my podcast in the iTunes store. So all you got to do is head over to iTunes where you may be listening to this podcast and leave a review, take a screenshot that you've left it and email it over to me at sahara at eatfeelfresh.com. Again, that's sahara, S-A-H-A-R-A at eat feelfresh.com. And I will send you back the first half of my unreleased book, Eat Right for Your Mind Body Type, which goes all into Ayurveda, doshas, plant-based nutrition, body types, all of the things in a really fun and engaging way. So this is my gift to you for free for supporting the podcast. Every single review I personally read, it really helps the podcast be listened to by more people so we can raise the vibration of the planet together. And I am so grateful to have you on this journey. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you on the next episode. Namaste. Namaste.